I pray and expect that the Holy Spirit has words from this scripture to speak to you. He, I also expect that the evil one wants to stop your ears from hearing it. That's why he cut the electricity last night, or at least helped to stop it. But we're not thwarted, and here we are, and we pray that your ears would be open to hear the word of the Lord. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we ask that you would be glorified. We pray for those who are struggling at this very moment, this very hour, that you would open their ears and enable them to hear your soothing words of comfort. Lord, for those who are struggling and suffering, we pray that your word would lift up and empower for holy living and for joyful expression of praise to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was in 2011 that Ryan, my uh, wife's cousin, and his wife, Laura, Ryan and Laura, they became Christian missionaries to the Muslim people who were living in the country of Georgia, the former Soviet country. Laura had a, a vibrant ministry to women, educating women, women in health and dealing with emotional healing. And Ryan had been given this amazing uh, vision to revitalize the ancient Azerbaijani carpet weaving traditions and then to use it as a way to bring the gospel uh, to uh, people living in those villages. And this turned out to be an incredibly successful, blessed ministry in which more than 20 families were thriving uh, through the making of the carpets and the carpet sales. And all the profits of this ministry were reinvested back into village projects that were actually chosen by uh, the weavers. And so uh, in one of the villages, uh, an old well had been uh, had been restored, helping many, many, many of the villagers with water. Uh, in another village, a, a community center received 400 sets of plates and all those sorts of things that were needed for weddings and, and for funerals. And God was moving in a tremendous way in which people were coming to Jesus and the church was growing. And then two years ago, this very month, Tracy and I received this terrible news that while on vacation camping in a remote part of Georgia, Ryan and his four-year-old son, his son's name was Caleb, was, they were gunned down. And then at the same time, Ryan's wife, Laura, who was with them, was raped by the same perpetrator and then brutally drowned. In fact, if you look down here, this beautiful hand-woven rug that sits on our communion table, it comes from Ryan and Laura's ministry from the country of Georgia. It sits usually in my church office, and it reminds me of the life and the gift and the blood of the witnesses of their life to those people. It also reminds me that suffering in one form or another, at one time or another, will come. It will come for me, and it will come for you. And when it comes, I have to ask myself the question, will I suffer well? Will I suffer well? When suffering comes for you, will you suffer well? First Peter, this short epistle, is all about suffering. And suffering is actually probably the major theme of the, of the entire letter. And first uh, chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 all directly reference the topic of suffering. In fact, 28% of the references to the noun or verb suffer or suffering occur in First Peter. It's more than any other book in the New Testament. And although First Peter makes up less than 1% of the New Testament, one-third of all references to suffering appear in this little book. And so no doubt Peter wants to teach us how to suffer well. 
And I think in order to really understand what Peter is trying to convey, let's first think or re at least recall, we've talked about it in the past, some of the historical background of 1 Peter. I think it helps shed light on what Peter is saying here in chapter 4. And then out of that, I'd like to share four spiritual priorities about suffering that occur in verses 1 through 11. But let's begin with the historical background. We we'll recall the historical background of 1 Peter. Peter wrote the letter of 1 Peter while living in Rome, and it was likely written between 60 and 64 AD. And like in other parts of the Roman Empire, Christians were experiencing increasing persecution from Jerusalem all around the Mediterranean all the way to Rome. And in particular in Rome, we see several events taking place in 41 AD. All the Jews were forbidden to have private assemblies, and that would have included Christians. And then in 49 AD, the Emperor Claudius expelled all the, all the uh, Jews from Rome, and that would have included Christians, since Christians and Jews were indistinguishable, at least at that point, within the Roman mind. And we're told by the uh, Roman historian Suetonius that, that Claudius expelled the Jews because of disputes over Crestus, and it's likely a reference to Jesus Christ and the disputes that were taking place. Well, after 49 AD, the standards began to relax, and Christians were eventually allowed back to return into Rome, but then only to face increasingly ho increasing hostility. In fact, in 64 AD, uh, the Emperor Nero notoriously scapegoated the Christians for the burning of Rome, a six-day fire that ravaged most of the city. And in the words of Gerhard Uhlhorn in his book, The Conflict of Christianity with Heathenism, he writes that Nero began a carnival of bloodshed that Rome had never yet seen. And so we read through secular historians how many Christians under Nero's reign of terror were crucified on crosses. Others in their games were sewn up in the skins of wild animals and then allowed for the dogs to tear them to pieces. Other Christians were tied to large bulls and then dragged around the Colosseum, gored and stomped upon. And then in Nero's evening climax, we're told that there was a display of huge torches in the imperial garden. You see, the Christians were wrapped in rope, coated in pitch, bound to stakes of pine, and then lighted and burned. Nero apparently drove on a chariot, decked out in his clothes, through the torches as the people shouted in delight. And Peter perhaps died at this point in time under this extreme persecution done under Nero's orders. Well, why did the Romans dislike or hate the Christians? Why did they choose to persecute them? And there have been three typical charges against the Christians by the Romans. One was cannibalism, another was incest, and the third was atheism. Cannibal, cannibalism because it was thought that the Christians somehow ate the flesh and drank the blood. Incest because Christian husbands called their Christian wives sisters, and Christian wives called their Christian husbands brothers. And atheism because Christians would not pinch incense to Caesar as part of the Roman imperial cult. They would not worship Caesar. And this, no doubt, is why the Roman state put its bullseye on the Christians and went after them. They were viewed as a political threat. They were treasonous. There was sedition. And so they were someone to get rid of. But what about the common Romans? Why, why did they dislike the Christians? Why did, why did they loathe them? Well, we're told in, in verse 4 of 1 Peter chapter 4, they think it's strange that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. So it would seem that the Christians were viewed by the Romans as being intolerant, 
They were refusing to participate in certain cultural norms that the Romans held up as part of their wonderful culture. Oh, they must have thought, you're just too good not to participate with us. And so they were looked down upon and even loathed. Well, were the, were the Christians troublemakers? Why wouldn't they participate in some of these norms that were held up and esteemed? Well, the answer is in our text in verse 11. It says, so that all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. You see, the, the Romans had constructed a society based on norms of tradition combined with power and pleasure uh, and some reason. But the Christians had a very different starting point. Their starting point was the resurrection of Jesus Christ within history that many of them had directly witnessed. And this served as the very foundation for all knowledge and, yes, for all of life. And so the Christians could not follow or participate, at least in some of these norms of Roman society, because the very Lord of history was known. And it was Christ's lordship that shows us how to live. And it's Christ's lordship that also shows us how to suffer well. So let's, with that background in mind, consider four spiritual priorities that Peter lays out here about suffering well. Maybe you're not suffering from persecution, although we recognize there are many believers around the world who are suffering terrible persecution, similar to what the Christians, our brothers and sisters, suffered there in Rome in the first century and around the Mediterranean. But maybe your suffering is cancer, or it's cognitive decline, or you're dealing with financial trouble or marriage problems. Maybe you're facing great disappointment in work or dysphoria around your identity. Or there is some longing of your heart that for too long has not come your way. Or there's something else. Something else, in fact, I've noticed as a pastor and talking with many of you, there's a lot of suffering going on in the lives of people within our congregation. Peter's priorities that he lays out for suffering within persecution, if they're true for the suffering and persecution, which you could argue is probably the most severe of, of suffering, if it's true for that, then it's also true for lesser forms, many of the forms that you and I are facing. So let's consider them. There are four. There are many more. We'll continue to talk about suffering in the, in the weeks ahead. But first... How do we suffer well? Peter first says, I would suggest to you, is to see God in suffering. See God in suffering. Now, among the Romans, suffering was pointless. The fates, they caused you to suffer, but it was directionless. There was, there was no narrative. It was just random acts that you had to face and endure. And that's contrasted in verse 1 of our text chapter 4, verse 1, in which Peter says, since Christ suffered in his body. And we'll stop right there for a moment. That is a radical claim that the sovereign creator, the providential sustainer of all of the universe, suffered. God in Christ suffered. And every ancient as well as modern worldview and religion rejects this very central claim of the Christian understanding. Platonism and the Greco-Roman world, which was rampant, believed that God was impassable. God surely could not suffer. Today, is Islam believes that God is purely transcendent. There is no way that he can suffer. Buddhism believes, well, suffering is an illusion. But Christians claim that Christ suffered in the body. And that has carried major implications for Christians, shaping our lives, our actions, and our culture. And so, in recognizing that God would suffer, Christians began to recognize that other sufferers, that somehow there was meaning embedded within the suffering. Because if God could suffer, 
then certainly suffering must have meaning. And rather viewing suffering as a curse, there somehow must be some divine purpose embedded within the suffering, within the fabric itself, which means it could be something that was honored. And so Christians pursued the poor, the imprisoned, the hungry, the sick, and all kinds of activities, recognizing that in them, the sufferers, that God's presence was somehow close because Christ suffered. And so Christians built hospitals. In fact, the sick were viewed by the Greco-Roman in the Greco-Roman world as cursed. But the Christians reversed it because they recognized that Christ suffered. Therefore, those who are sick are somehow blessed because God's presence is with them in a very unique way. And so we must remember that God is in the cross as much as God is in the resurrection. God is, God's presence is in both. God is in the blessing, but God is also in the trouble. Suffering is not meaningless, because if God can suffer, then there must surely be purpose and meaning in which God draws the good out of the evil. And so it's an invitation for us to see God in our suffering. You say, I don't see that. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. If you will pay attention to what's going on in your suffering, I'm certain, as I've even experienced it in my own life, you will see God there. He's present within. If you would open up your eyes and ask the Lord to show you. So first, see God in suffering. The second priority is this. How to suffer well is to surrender to transformation. Surrender to the transformation that suffering brings. Now, in the Roman culture, suffering was fruitless. It was pointless. It didn't have any benefit. You just had to endure it. But listen to Peter again in verses 1 and 2. He says, arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. And as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Now, what is Peter saying here? He's saying that the experience of suffering both rouses our spiritual slumber and it refines us, transforming us. It rouses us. We can be spiritually sleepy. sleepy. And when we begin to suffer, there's something that can happen in which the Holy Spirit says, wake up, wake up. I've told this story before, but there was a patient who I interviewed at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He had a diagnosis of metastatic cancer, and he sat there in front of me, and he said, Michael, this cancer is the very best thing that has ever happened to me. Because before the cancer, I was living for all of these meaningless reasons. But with the cancer, I've, I've changed and reprioritized my entire life, and I've discovered Christ. And I've discovered the joy of the Lord. It roused him, but it also refines us. Suffering exposes our pride, our, our self-centeredness, our lack of trust in God, our trust in ourselves. It exposes our fear. Suffering confronts our sin. And it, if it does, if it allowed to do its work, it will shake sin so that what Peter says becomes true. We become dead or done with sin. Dostoevsky once said, there is only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my suffering. How do you become worthy of your suffering? By allowing it to transform you, to purify you as the refiner's fire, to melt off the dross so that you would come forth as pure silver. So how do you suffer well? You surrender to its transformation. You will allow it to do its work. Third, how do you suffer well? You stand ready for judgment. You stand ready for judgment. In Rome, among the Romans, suffering was part of a hopeless outlook. The afterlife within the Greco-Roman world, within Roman world, was a sad place 
full of gray figures and ghostly shadows. Most of the Romans did not believe in, in, in a judgment. The afterlife was just a gloomy, unclear end. In fact, there was a common Latin inscription over many tombs that went like this. I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. That's the Roman understanding. You can contrast this with verse 5 and verse 6 where he says, get ready to, that God is ready to judge the living and the dead. And this verse 6, which is a difficult verse to understand, he says, for this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. And I would suggest to you that what Peter is saying here is that those who are now dead refers to the Christians who had been persecuted and who had died. It's they who had received the gospel and they were, it says, judged according to human standards. It's they the, that the Romans judged as worthless, not worthy to live according to their own cultural standards. But then he says, but they live according to God in regard to the Spirit. In other words, even though those who have followed Christ have died, they're not dead. They're alive in God, in the Spirit. Ryan and Laura and Caleb, they're alive. They're in the presence of God. And so it's a very hopeful outlook. God is, it says in verse 5, ready to judge the living and the dead. This is comforting. These are comforting words to those who follow Christ. Why? Because Christ stands in our stead. If we put our faith in Christ, the coming judgment is not something to be afraid of because we know that he is able to save us by his righteousness and not our own. But... For those who are not in Christ will have to face the coming judgment of God. So we need to suffer well by surrender, surrendering to the transformation, by being ready for judgment, knowing that it is good news to stand before a king who has taken our sins and suffered in our stead. But then finally, to suffer well, is to stay centered on love. Stay centered on love. Now, from what I've been able to understand, the popular Roman approach to suffering was what we might call a now-centered focus, not unlike our own culture. We should avoid suffering. Even if you have to sacrifice your own integrity, avoid suffering. Don't think about suffering. Just stay focused on what you can control now in the present. And then you want to keep it positive. This is the Roman view. Aim for personal success and flourishing. Make that your focus. Don't, don't worry about suffering. And then they add on within this now-centered focus of, of increased pleasure. And that's when Peter, in verse 3, he names these Roman pleasures which are essentially avoidance techniques of engagement of these pleasures of the flesh in order to not think about the suffering that is coming. Peter in, judges this in verse 4. He calls it reckless, wild living. It, it, it's an empty shell. It's meaningless to engage in these sorts of pleasures because they lead nowhere and they do not prepare you for the coming day when you will, when you will suffer. A now-centered focus helps you all the way up to the point when suffering starts, and then its weaknesses become clear. Its techniques do not work. So then what's left for the person who has been living in a now-centered way of thinking? Well, they withdraw, they isolate, they're often abandoned by others who are under that now-centered thinking. 
because the sufferer is a reminder to them of what is coming for them. So abandon the sufferer, and then you don't have to think about it. And within that state, it's a great temptation to choose despair, to disappear within your suffering. Has that been your experience as you've suffered? You want to dig a hole and just go lie in it and be away from others? Peter calls us from away from a now-centered approach to suffering to what we might call a love-centered focus. And here he lays out four verbs in verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. He calls us to pray, to love, and then in verse 9, to show hospitality, and then to exercise our spiritual gifts in verses 10 and 11 through acts of service and of speaking. Think about that. These are words being given not to those who are strong and have everything lined up, but to sufferer, the suffering Christian, Peter is calling to be love-centered, to pursue these things even within the shadow of their own suffering. A love-centered focus, rather than withdrawing and despairing, focuses on engagement and community. It's not a woe-is-me attitude in which you put your head in the sand block out everyone. In fact, Peter, what Peter is saying here is that if you are suffering, Christian, you have a moral obligation to pursue the Lord and those around you. Maybe you have limited energy. Well, then you need to plan ahead and gather your energy that you can each day and use it in love, exercising your gifts. Maybe you're listening to my voice and you're lying in bed and that's where you stay. Even you have an obligation and a joy to pray and to take on a ministry of prayer for many people. Peter is saying that suffering is not an excuse to retire or to call it quits. Suffering is the time now to engage. In fact, within the Christian tradition, There's been a long encouragement to those, especially those who are suffering illness, that it is your obligation in your sickness to use it like a bully pulpit in speaking the good news to those around you. You take your illness and you leverage it to tell others about God's love. And in fact, ears will listen to you more than to listening to those who are healthy. Finally, he finishes, we can focus especially here on on verse 8, where he says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins, which is a, a reference to Proverbs chapter 10, which we read earlier in the service. Sometimes, oftentimes, our suffering is caused by others, their actions, their selfish wrongful actions that harm us and create significant loss in our life. What are we to do? How are we to respond to them? Well, this act of love is covering over. That's not a, a, just a dismissal of bad actions, bad behavior. It's not just ignoring those wrongful things that cause you suffering. He's, Peter's not saying that. Rather, this action of covering over is specifically a reference to forgiveness. Peter calls us to exercise forgiveness over those who have inflicted suffering on us. Like Jesus, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's ironic as well that When you fail to forgive, and this is one of the great temptations of suffering much under the hands of others, one of the ironic experiences is that you suffer more when you fail to forgive those who have caused suffering on you. And so Peter is calling us, 
He's calling you in the moments of this suffering to live into it, to re-engage, to make your approach a love-centered approach, to pray, to forgive, to show hospitality without grumbling, he says, and to exercise your spiritual gifts in speaking and in service. So let's recap. What are Peter's four spiritual priorities? To, to see God in the suffering, to surrender to transformation, to stand ready for the judgment, and then finally to stay centered on love. Just recently, Lynn Smith, who is the mother of Ryan Smith, who died two years ago, she publicly released a personal letter that she wrote to Kabari, who was the perpetrator of that rape and the triple murder. And I'd like to read, it's a five-page letter that was written to him, and I'd just really like to read a short part of it. She writes, it's a personal letter written on October 1st, 2018, by Ryan's mother to Kabari. It was written th three months after Kabari murdered them. Kabari, she writes, and I'm just going to read little snippets. I hope you have learned about the wonderful family you killed, how they loved God and they served others. We were and still are very proud of our son Ryan, Laura, and Caleb. They have lovingly touched so many lives in so many places. These are the loving people you murdered. When I learned of the despicable actions, I grieved the fear, the panic, the demonic horrors that our sweet Laura had to endure. At your hands, Laura, seeing or hearing you shoot her beloved husband, Ryan, our, my son. Laura, hearing the frantic screams of her precious Caleb when you shot him, shot his daddy. Then Laura, hearing you shoot her only living child, an innocent four-year-old boy, my grandson. Only you know how you assaulted Laura and the cause of Laura's death, but if you do know, you killed, but I do know that you killed our sweet Laura also. Everything you did to Laura, Ryan, and Caleb was pure evil and demonic. She continues, you have no idea the pain, grief, suffering, tremendous losses that you have caused our family and Laura's family. You've robbed us all of our future joy and fun memories of being with Ryan, Laura, and Caleb in Georgia, and when they visited us here in America. We will miss the fun of watching Caleb grow up and any other children that Ryan and Laura may have had. The loss and grief you feel when your loved one dies are so overwhelmingly painful that you can hardly breathe. There's a giant hole in your heart and family. Nothing seems quite right anymore. Missing Ryan, Laura, and Caleb for the rest of my life will be far more difficult. Our family is seeking truth and justice because of your assault and triple murders of our innocent family. I request that you be sentenced to a full 30 years in prison without early release or to life in prison so you can never harm or kill other people as you did our wonderful son, Ryan, our sweet, thoughtful daughter-in-law, Laura, our precious four-year-old grandson. Caleb. And then she says, all of our family, many friends, are praying for you, Kabari. And we're praying for your innocent family. May God have mercy on you, Kabari. May you come to true repentance for your truly evil actions. May you cry out to Jesus, asking for and thanking him for his complete forgiveness of all your sins because he died on the cross to pay the full penalty for every sin by every person for all time, including you, assaulting Laura and murdering Ryan, Laura, and Caleb. Kabari, you do not deserve Jesus' forgiveness. I do not deserve Jesus' forgiveness. No one deserves it. But God the Father, out of his incredible love for you and for me, sent his son, Jesus. That is why Ryan's father, Byron, and I have chosen to forgive you.
for murdering our wonderful son, our sweet, thoughtful Laura, our precious four-year-old grandson. We do not want to live in the bondage of unforgiveness, bitterness, hatred, or ill will towards you. We have chosen to trust God to fill the huge hole in our hearts and to enable us to live with our pain and loss of Ryan and Laura and Caleb for many, many years to come. Then she goes on and on teaching Kabari about the scriptures. And she tells him in one part, you might be surprised, she says, to learn that there were several key men in the Bible who once were murderers like you. Moses, King David, and the Apostle Paul, she says, were all murderers, but later God used each one of them for good, just like God wants to use you for good, even in prison. And then she finishes, Kabari, my letter may seem very strange. The truth is you committed disgusting crimes against our dear family. Justice requires that you pay a just penalty for everything that you did. But God loves and God's love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8, including all of your sins. Our family is praying that you will accept God's love and forgiveness found in Jesus. In Jesus' love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness, Lynn Smith. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Lynn's witness of forgiveness. We thank you that you can do such a powerful good of drawing good out of evil. And we pray that as this story is still undone, that you would do a powerful work in the life of Kubari and the many others around the world who need your love. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are suffering right now. I pray that you would empower them with your love, that you would free them from the prison of withdrawal and isolation and lack of forgiveness. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would take our suffering as a holy offering to you, and you would do good things with it. We believe that you will. We entrust ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.